So I actually, I don't know if you do this, but my, my favorite part is when I actually am finishing a first draft, I write the end. Yes, I do that too. And then I, I delete it, too. but yeah. I type yeah. the end. Yeah. Exclamation <laughs> Yes. Yes. And take a picture. Yes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We have two celebrated Canadian novelists, expat Canadians, Canadians nevertheless, joining us in the salon tonight, Lori Lanzens and Sarah Groon. <laughs> Welcome to Toronto. Uh, they're going to have a conversation with Global Television's uh, Liza Fromer. This is her return to the salon. Uh, welcome, Liza. Hi, this is so amazing. It's so fantastic to see so many people come out to support books, to support reading, and to support these two wonderful authors. So I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about both of them. Sarah Gruen has one of those terrific stories that reminds you that you should always believe in your sense of yourself and your talents. Her third book, Water for Elephants, which I'm sure people are familiar with, <laughs> absolutely, was turned down by her publisher. So, someone else decided to pick it up, smart them. Uh, it went on to be a New York Times bestseller. It was translated into 44 languages and turned into a movie starring Reese Witherspoon. Her current novel, At the Water's Edge, takes you on a search through Scotland, and the year is 1944. Please welcome Sarah Gruen. Our next author, Lori Lances, Lansons, is an international bestseller. The Wife's Tale sold to 10 countries, The Girls to 21, and Rush Home Road to 15 countries around the world. The author Anne-Marie MacDonald calls her latest book The Mountain Story, equal parts poignant drama and palm sweaty suspense. Please welcome Lori Lansons. <laughs> oh, you got it. So the way this evening will go is uh, each of the authors will do a short reading from their books, and then we'll do a little question and answer up here, and then if you have any questions for the authors, think about that, and that's how we'll sort of wrap up the night as well. So please first welcome Sarah Gruen. Hank set up the tripod and screwed the camera onto it while Ellis spread out a blanket and pulled a variety of things from the bag. Beakers, binoculars, compasses, a thermometer, maps, and logbooks. Although I hadn't gone to college, it all looked terribly scientific to me. I arranged myself on the blanket and looked out over the loch's glistening surface. If Hank was right about how deep it was, I was having trouble imagining it. Were its depths as low as the hills were high? The loch became so deep, so dark, so quickly, it seemed as impenetrable as the fortress beside us once was. Ellis ran through the plan. First, we record the temperature of the water. Then we take a sample to see how much peat is floating at the surface. It affects visibility and also tells us how strong the undercurrent is. Then we record surface conditions, weather conditions, wind speed and direction, etc. We'll repeat all of this once an hour. And in between, I asked. Hank took over. In between, we scan the surface of the water and watch for disturbances. If you see something, call monster, and we'll confirm its location by compass, and I'll begin filming. You two keep it in your sights at all times in case I somehow lose it in the viewfinder. There were supposed to be three pairs of binoculars and three compasses, but one of the compasses was missing. Ellis gave me one of the remaining two, insisting that he and Hank could share. When I finally admitted I didn't know how to use it, I expected some kind of smart aleck response, or at the very least an eye roll. Instead, they simply showed me. It's easy, said Alice, guiding my hands. Turn it, like this, until the arrow points north. Now, imagine a straight line from the degrees marked around the edge to the object you're looking at and read the number next to it. And really, that's all there is to it. I successfully confirmed the location of a speck of shore on the opposite bank which we decided would define one edge of my viewing area. I was to start there and scan to the left, slowly, carefully, 
before coming back and going just far enough past the landmark to ensure a little overlap with Ellis. Hank had no boundaries, which I thought hilarious, but since they hadn't made fun of me for my lack of technical knowledge, I refrained from making a joke. A few minutes after we began, I thought I saw something and swung my binoculars back. A rounded thing was poking out of the water, moving steadily and leaving a series of Vs in its wake. Monster, I shouted, monster. Where, Maddie, where, said Ellis. I leapt to my feet, pointing strenuously. There, over there, do you see it? Use your compass, Ellis cried. Keep your eyes on it, Hank ordered, dropping his binoculars and getting behind the camera. He bent over it, peering through the viewfinder, cupping one hand around it for shade. I can't do both, I said desperately. What should I do? It's okay, I see it, Ellis shouted. Maddie, keep your eyes on it. God damn it, I think we've got it. He jumped up and held the campus right, uh, compass right next to the camera so Hank could steal glances at it while aiming the lens. It's at 70 degrees, Ellis said, coaching Hank. Still at 70. Now it's just past 70. Still moving. Call it 70 and a quarter. Got it, said Hank. He began turning the crank handle on the camera, quickly, at least two rotations per second. I had my eyes locked on the object in the water. It flipped on its back, exposing whiskers and a black nose. Oh my God, I said, utterly deflated. I'm so sorry. About what, said Hank, still cranking away. It's an otter. <laughs> Ellis, Hank said, continuing to film. Ellis picked his binoculars back up. After a short pause, he lowered them and said, she's right, it's an otter. Hank let go of the handle and straightened up. He shaded his eyes with his hand and gazed over the water. Oh, well, he said, sitting down. Never mind. At least we know Maddie's got sharp eyes. Ellis recorded the event in the logbook. Hank lit a cigarette, and they passed a flask, which I declined. I'm sorry, I said, after calling the alarm over a duck. It's all right, Ellis said with false cheer. Better to have a hundred false alarms than to miss the real thing. He duly recorded it and took the water's vitals again, and we resumed our watch. I'm really sorry, I said, after the floating log. <laughs> Never mind, said Ellis. I suppose it did look a little like a creature's back from that distance. When I apologized for the jumping fish, Hank said, Ellis, maybe you could take a quick peek at whatever Maddie's looking for at before anyone calls the official alarm. <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea, Ellis said, clearly dispirited, because if it's the real thing, that kind of delay would give it time to dive down. That's why my father only got three pictures. I stared at his back. He really did believe his father. This wasn't just about fixing himself. It was also about vindicating the colonel. How could I have been so clueless about my own husband? I sat beside him on the blanket, so close our shoulders were touching. Hank sat next to us and lit a cigarette. That's all well and good as long as we don't run out of film, he muttered. Pass the flask, will you? Four and a half hours later, Hank had smoked 11 cigarettes, he and Ellis had th finished a third flask, and I had seen a twig, two thrashing ducks, and a second airborne fish. <laughs> Thank you. That was Sarah Gruen, of course, and now to uh, read from The Mountain Story, Lori Lansons. <clears throat> This is a male narrator, so I want you all to imagine that I am George Clooney reading this right now, okay? Dear Daniel, a person has to have lived a little to appreciate a survival story. That's what I've always said. And I promised that when you were old enough, I'd tell you mine. It's no tale for a child, but you're not a child anymore. You're older now than I was when I got lost on, in the wilderness. Five days in the freezing cold without food or water or shelter. You know that part. And you know that I was with three strangers and that not everyone survived. What happened up there changed my life, Danny. Hearing the story is going to change yours. The day I got lost with the others that fateful November day was the one year anniversary of Bird's accident. It was a tough year and I didn't think it could get worse. Then my father got drunk on Halloween night and killed a young couple with his car. My best friend was gone. My father, Frankie, sent to prison for vehicular manslaughter. I was on my own. 
No one to keep abreast of my plans, not that I would have told anyone about my trip to the mountain anyway, because on that cool gray afternoon, which was also the day of my 18th birthday, I had decided to hike to a spot called Angel's Peak to jump to my death. No one else knows that part of the story, not even your mother. The night before I left for Angel's Peak, I didn't sleep at all, yet I lingered in my bed until almost noon. Finally, I rose, pulled on some clothes, and found the warm wool socks that Bird had given me two Christmases before. I tied the laces on my hiking boots for the first time in a year and reached for my knapsack hanging on a hook near the front door. I hesitated and put the knapsack back, a moment that would haunt me because I had no further need of the Swiss army knife or food rations or water or blankets and didn't want the things to go to waste. The tramway worked on a double jig back system with one cable car heading up the mountain while the second came down. It hung on 27 miles of interlocking cable strung between five massive towers bolted into the Rocky Mountainside. At each of the five towers, the tram car made, tram car made a transition and rocked like a carnival ride for a minute or two, longer if the winds were high. Riders had strong reactions, especially first timers. As we approached the first tower, I steadied myself. The woman with the ponytail had just opened one of her water bottles. Rookie. The tram conductor, whom I thankfully did not recognize, announced over the microphone, we're approaching the first tower, ladies and gentlemen, hold on tight. He paused dramatically. There will be sway. The three women and I, walked silently for nearly an hour, over the rocks, through the granite passes and the village of thick white firs. At some point I realized we'd begun making a gentle descent. I knew the way back to Secret Lake should be a gradual ascent. I remember telling myself that it was just a different way, a shortcut, that would eventually take us back up, and so I led them. That must be said. You're very calm in a crisis, Wolf, Nola said. I was tempted to point out that we would not be here were it not for me. If our past hadn't crossed, the women would have been at the bottom of a crevice or lost on some other part of the mountain, or maybe they'd have given up trying to find the lake and headed back to the mountain station. If our past hadn't crossed, I would be no more. That's when I noticed that my despair, which had weighted me down since Bird's accident and been deepened by Frankie's imprisonment, was gone. Lost in the fall, along with Bridget's mesh, mesh bag and my tiger's baseball cap. It was like some switch had been flipped off, or maybe it was on. That first night on the mountain with the three women shivering together in the dark, we were not lost, but stranded with the long night before us. You'd, you'd think we would have gone around the circle and told a little bit about ourselves. You'd think we might have taken a minute or two to discuss what just happened, and what we should do next. You'd think that one of us would have cried, or freaked out, or laid blame. We did none of those things, at least not at first. Vaughn hesitated. Wolf. You know how people turn to God in their darkest moments? I guess. I thought of the sunrise, how astonished I'd been moved to tears. But Wolf, isn't that like being a fair weather fan in sports? I mean, do you, do you think if there's a God, he sees it like that? <laughs> I shrugged. Well, can God see us now, do you think, Wolf? Does he know we're stranded on this ledge? I paused for a long moment because I realized I didn't want to speculate. I couldn't bear to think that God was aware of our suffering and couldn't reconcile his nature if he wasn't. I'm afraid I've caged the mountain story for so long it'll die in the wild, Danny. Mom wishes it already had. 
Here it is. And as you read this, remember our family motto. There will be sway. Thank you. Um, tell me about the name Wolf Truly. <laughs> I, I noticed that, obviously, right away, and thought that it's very unique. Like, it seems like it must be very representative. It, it is. In, in fact, um, my grandfather, my, my maternal grandfather's name is Wilfred. And he was such a survivor. And, and one of the you know, most exciting stories I heard as a young child was about my grandfather. When he was an infant in 1918, three months old, he contracted the Spanish flu. And he was dying. His parents didn't expect him to live out the night. They watched him slowly fade until he wasn't breathing anymore in his cradle. His father went to fetch a shroud that they would bury him in. And his mother couldn't bear to see him like that, picked him up and began to shake him, shook mucus from his lungs. He coughed and was reborn. So this was one of my first stories. So you can imagine that Wilfred is synonymous with survival for me. And Wolf was, because he's a lone wolf, just seemed appropriate. So it was, it was sort of those, those dual reasons. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing story. It is. That's and it's true. It's incredible. <laughs> the, the best ones always are, aren't they? Sarah, back to, to you about the idea of searching. They're, they're searching at Loch Ness. And there's also some sense of searching for identity, I would think, that, yeah. that their identities change along the way as far as their, their self-identity. Can you talk about that? Yeah, there's definitely the external search because my trio of young Americans um, from a very privileged tier of society decide that the most important thing at the height of World War II is to go to the highlands and find the Loch Ness monster. Um, so that is going on, but it mostly it's the, the, the monster in the loch, um, looming in the loch, is representative of the monsters within. Um, of course, there are monsters all the way through and all the way up to Hitler, but really it's, it's about um, find, looking inside and what do you find there, and also in the people around you, and um, what do you do with the truth when you find it? Do you turn and face it and embrace it and decide how to move forward, or do you find it unpalatable and try to run from it, or do you try to glue Humpty Dumpty mm. back together mm. again? So it's, it's very much about facing these internal monsters. What attracted you to the time period, to 1944, World War II? Well, that happened secondary to finding the setting because I was procrastinating in my mm -hmm. office one day. I'm really, really good at writing avoidance. Um, <laughs> Typically, I paint my, my family room, and I actually painted it seven different shades of orange. It's very hard to find the right shade. What looks good in the evening looks like a McDonald's in the morning. But, <laughs> so I was up there and, and just sort of surfing, and I ran across a random news article about uh, declassified government documents. And one of the letters that had been uncovered after seven years was written by a high-level Scotland Yard official. And it was very clear that there was no doubt in his mind or anybody's mind that the monster existed, and he was worried that the police would not be able to protect it from big game hunters. And so I just fell right down a Nessie rabbit hole, and I spent the afternoon there. And I went to uh, Urquhart Castle the first time in the Highlands, the first time when I was 12, and I fell instantly in love with the place. I love ruined castles more than I love intact castles because with intact castles, you don't know it's been patched and spackled. Mm -hmm. And with the ruins, you just know that it's all authentic and everything you're standing on is right where everything happened. Mm -hmm. um, I also was sure I was gonna see Nessie. <laughs> um, and I stayed with my little uh, wind up Kodak camera and you know, waited and waited and waited. And anyway, so that, the love of that setting was latent. And um, I was, in fact, between books, which is why I was doing my very, very best procrastinating. And so that was like, bingo, that's where I'm going to do the next book. And I had no idea about the time, the time period yet, but I immediately booked the research trip, the first research trip. So I was there for two weeks. And I thought I might include the Scotland Yard thing at first, but that just didn't really sound interesting to me. So um, I found that Scotland was much more involved, especially the Highlands was much more involved in World War II than I had ever thought. Uh, the D-Day landings were practiced there. Uh, the modern day commando, as we know it, is originated in World War II. Um, the Lord Lovett, the 16th Lord Lovett, created them because his uh, the 14th Lord Lovett, his grandfather, was so impressed by the 
commandos with a K that he saw fighting in the Boer War. So these small elite groups of fighters, um, so that he, this guy gave up his castle, Achnakeri Castle, which became Castle Commando. And uh, so these, these uh, groups of commandos, the Green Berets as we know them, um, happened, came about because of uh, a Highland Lord. And, um, and they were very, you know, they, so once in a while to mix things up, the Germans would send the bombers flying from Norway down the Glen instead of across the channel. So it was really, you know, there were a lot of uh, World War II things going on. So I thought that would be a really interesting um, sort of background because I do like to always have the macro reflect the micro in my book. So there, it, if there's a really big world incident going on, then I can usually do something with that. Um, and then the story itself didn't come to me until the end of the first two-week trip, and I was in, I was in the castle, and I went in February, which is when most people are trying to get out of Scotland, not in. <laughs> so we were, um, it was just my guide and me, and we were walking around, and the, all these little bits of uh, lore and just little factoids and things that had been floating around in my head and that I'd been sort of tucking away started to take form and become a story. And this happened at the Watergate. If you, any of you have read the book, it's very important in the book, and it's happened at the water's edge. Um, but this thing started taking shape, so I sent my guide back to the car, and I was absolutely alone in this huge tourist trap. If you go there in the summer, you're tripping mm -hmm. all over everybody. Um, and I just I took up my cell phone, and I stomped around for a couple of hours just dictating into my cell phone, dictating the ideas. And so you know, setting first, timing later, and then story third. That, I, I, I'm always so fascinated by the process of how the story comes to you. And Lori, so you're in a slightly more temperate place, Palm Springs or the mountains. Yeah. Uh, what, how much does setting impact your storytelling? Well, in this case, the mountain is certainly a character. Um, and I, I start with the characters. I begin with the characters and the character of Wolf, was, was really born out of, out of a tragedy in my southwestern um, California community. Uh, there was a, a cluster of teenage suicides. And it, it affected me very deeply. Um, one of the children was our neighbor. And uh, I guess I, I'm finding that my writing is really reactive, and I wanted to change the outcome for this character. So that's where the, the character came from. And the divine women, these generations of divines that I write about in the book, I, I sort of had them tucked away, waiting, waving at me from the sidelines, pick me next. And, um, and as Sarah said, that, you know, the components of the story, they, they sort of, there's, there's a magnet, and they sort of start just, just coming at you. And uh, I'd wanted to write a survival story. I wanted to challenge myself and sort of step out of my comfort zone and write uh, about uh, um, a suspenseful novel and a thrilling novel, an adventure story. Uh, I was going to set it in the Santa Monica Mountains where I live, but I didn't think it would be believable that, that they could be lost for five days. So when I went to Mount San Jacinto, which is a real place, um, and it is, it is in Palm Springs, you, you board the tram in your flip-flops with a 100 degree temperature, and you go up to the top in the wintertime, and there's snow. So it's a magical place. There's no other place like it. A tram takes you up in, in 15 minutes, and you're suddenly in a different climate. So um, that magical place really appealed to me. And, and it was clear the day that we stepped on San Jacinto, and my husband and I got lost on a trail and did not handle it graciously. I think we just said, you were the one who said. No, you were the one who said. <laughs> ah, I, I knew that this is where I needed to be. and, and yeah. <laughs> I, you're both Canadian, born in Canada, raised in Canada, now living in the United States, both of you. Does that inform your writing in any way, Experience bo experiencing both of the cultures? I'm not sure that the American part really influences me so much, because I spent my first 31 years here, and I, mm -hmm. I studied English literature at Carleton, so mm -hmm. I was reading Canadian literature. Right. Um, so I, I guess I would say I'm influenced by Canadian literature probably most. More so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting question. Um, I, I certainly feel that the same. I, I was here until I was 43, so I, I mean, I'm imprinted. And I feel very Canadian, and I feel that, like I bring that to my work. I'm just not sure that it's, it's always something that, something that you can point to, especially when the book is not set in Canada. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you, you were talking a little bit about your writing process, or avoidance thereof. <laughs> uh, do you, you know, I know some people would like, Hemingway would set a schedule from this time to this mm -hmm. time, I'm going to be writing, and that's mm -hmm. that every single day. Do you do that, or do you kind of do it more as the spirit moves you? Well, I, I, I'll just say that I have middle school children, and they move me. <laughs> and they, they determine basically when I'm going to be writing. I write while they're at school, so the muse is the on button on my computer. And uh, I write every day, sort of like a job. I take it very seriously, and you know, you have to. Um, and so, yeah. School hours. Yeah, school hours. School hours. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Used to wave them off yeah. and go straight to my computer. Yeah. Um, and I don't have a certain number of hours a day because I, that drives me nuts. I mean, I, I sort of, I started out with the first book. I would write, I decided I was going to write 2,000 words a day. Yeah, and I did, but, you know, that meant I was, like, using everybody's yeah. full name, middle name included, no contractions. So, <laughs> Double um, spaced. Right. <laughs> so, um, That's how so, I wrote college essays. Right. So, <laughs> the, so the next time it was 2,000 words a day or eight hours, whichever came first, and now I'm just a little bit more flexible about it because sometimes if the words aren't coming, it's because there's a plot problem or something mm -hmm. that the back half of my brain that I don't really understand, the creative mm -hmm. part, it's working on it. Mm -hmm. So I just have to sort of wait and I'll usually write stuff that I'm, I feel like I'm writing the rest out of the pipes. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to throw that out. And I know I'm gonna have to throw that out, but I am getting somewhere with it, so it was necessary. But um, it's a really messy process for me. I mean, I do not start and write a first full draft. I start and then I get to here and then I start to know my characters and then I have to throw that part out and start over again and then I realize that it's really this person this part of the book go back switch to first person and you know and it's just yeah so I actually I don't know if you do this but my, my favorite part is when I actually am finishing a first draft I write the end yes I do that too and then I, I delete it too. but yeah. I type yeah. the end yeah. exclamation <laughs> yes point. yes and take a picture yes. That's so interesting because it seems like, you know, you do it and you, like, is it a love-hate? So many writers seem to say that it's like, you, you do it because you kind of have to do it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's hard. It hurts a bit. I say that um, the only thing that makes me crazier than writing is not writing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the lesser of two evils. <laughs> but it's very, if things are going well and it's there and it's coming out in buckets and I feel like I'm catch it, capturing it rather than creating it, then it's kind of a high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole lot of times when it's not like that. And there's, you know, I think the further, the more novels I write, the higher the highs get and the lower the lows get. Mm -hmm. So I can get into pretty bad places when I just, you know, I hate this novel. Why would anyone ever want to read it? You know, just things like that. Yeah, and yeah. But you're, you're just so close to it. And then yeah. you're also experiencing everything your characters go through. Absolutely. And so it's, you know, you, you I have to sort of cleanse the palate and sort of do mm -hmm. a meditation at the end of the workday mm -hmm. so I can go downstairs and be a human being at dinner. Change the channel. Yeah. It's hard to change the channel after a workday. And, and I still and, yeah. sleep it and dream it. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And I, I, I sort of think of writing as an addiction. It feels like that to me. You feel yeah, the pull absolutely. of your characters. And I, I, if it's going poorly, I'm driven to get back there to fix whatever problem, find the problem and fix it. And if it's going well, then, well, it's going well, I'm on a roll. I can't, I can't stop. stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can stop anytime. I can stop. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> I hear that. And that's, that's fascinating to me. I feel that way a little bit too, even with TV and if I'm, you know, mm -hmm. trying to plan interviews mm -hmm. for the next day and that sort of thing. And then my kids come in the door, same thing, where it's like, Oh, oh, or, or even, you know, turning off the idea of being like a little bit alpha yeah, and sure. trying to be, oh, okay, I'm not in charge yeah. of everything now. Do you feel, like, how do you make that little switch? I like to stay in charge of everything. Yeah. <laughs> I try not to make that switch at all. I'm very comfortable there. <laughs> Bravo. Embrace. Don't fight. Embrace. Sarah, same thing. Ditto. Same, yeah. Love that. Okay, I just learned a big old lesson. Um, would anybody like to ask a question out in the audience? If you do, there's a microphone right there in the middle. I, my question specifically is for Laurie. When you talked about um, the mountain story specifically and writing uh, out of your comfort zone, did you have any 
special techniques for writing out of your comfort zone, like taking a risk or that sort of thing, or do you just go and see what happens? Well, I just think this time the process was a little bit different be because I, it, because it, it is a, a thriller, an adventure story, and there is a lot of suspense and mystery. I found that I had to sort of write backwards in order to sort of um, drive this road and make the twist and turns and hide all the information that I, I need to hide from you. So that was a real challenge. And then writing in a male voice was, was somewhat different for me, but I, I, I joke that I'm a, a method writer and I, <laughs> yeah, oh, do you really? I, me and Sarah, expat method writers. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, <laughs> and and you do. You, there, there's this sense that you are channeling, yeah, the, the, whichever character it is. So there's no discomfort thinking, oh, do I sound male enough, or do I sound conjoined enough, or whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, it just, <laughs> yeah, it just comes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you for your question. No Thank you. I'm Lori's husband, and she is very bossy. <laughs> <laughs> this. This question is for Sarah. Sarah, I know that for Lori, there's always that leap of faith that she has to make because she spends five years alone in a room and she literally yeah. is either with our kids yeah. or alone yeah. or fending off me. Uh, <laughs> but then there comes that time when it's time to put on the show. It's yeah. time to go out and sell the book. Yeah. And I'm wondering for you, is that a difficult switch to make or is that just part of the process that you are engaged in now and how that works for you? It's a dramatic change, but mm. I like it because I do. Uh, this one mm. took me four years mm. and... I turn into a hermit, yeah, an agoraphobic, yeah. pajama-wearing, yeah. non-hair-cutting, non -hair -cutting. Roots. Really? Of roots. Absolutely. I, I realized at one point that I had actually not stepped outside my front door for six weeks. Oh, I didn't that. even think yeah. that was weird, but my yeah. husband was like, Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and so I have nighttime pajamas, yeah. I have good pajamas, yeah. I have daytime pajamas, yeah. Yeah. and so then it's yeah. time to go on tour, and it's like, oh, God, yeah. I have to go buy some I'm real close. clothes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and I, so, that's so surprising to me, because yeah. I've only just met you guys tonight, but, you know, back in the green room, chatty and, like, very exuberant, I can't imagine you both, and like, it's like, just somebody let me solitary. out of a cage. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's some degree of, of pulling on this other personality yeah. um, when you have to come out on stage and I'm the writer who talks now instead of the writer who doesn't want to talk. Oh, and I, I you know, if, I hear, if I'm writing and yeah. I'm in that zone and I've gotten through that creative yeah. portal and I'm channeling my characters, mm -hmm. The house better be burning down if oh, someone knocks yeah. on my office oh, door. Yeah. And I, I didn't have an office before this book. This is the first book oh. I've had an office. So I had sort of an office. I thought that if I had a curtain, I could pull it. No, because people, no, people would walk behind it and breathe, yeah. and I'd want to kill like them. That. So, I don't like yeah. that. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Come on up. Hi there. Um, my question is for Lori. Um, coming from Chatham, it was very exciting to read books that were set in Chatham. And... I gave your books to all my Chatham, everybody who needed to know about Chatham, so Thank they would you. know about Chatham. Um, question, did you always want to write about Chatham, or was it... Um, <laughs> no, no, no. Is, is it write what you know, or is it, did you like the stories from the area? Or? Yeah, I, I was so inspired by that part of southwestern Ontario. I mean, the history is so rich. You, you, it's, a, it's a terminus on the Underground Railroad, it was a hot spot for bootlegging. It was a battleground during the War of 1812. And I liked history. So, you know, I was inspired. I wanted to bring that. I wanted to tell people, do you know what happened? Is that where I came from? So, yes, and I was very proud. I was very proud to write about my hometown. And thank you for sharing my books. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. I want to ask you, Sarah, uh, just going back to your previous uh, novel, Water for Elephants, when that... How did that go from a book to a movie? Uh, <laughs> I signed on the dotted line. Right. So, like, do you put that forward? Does your publisher put that forward? Does Hollywood come knocking to you? Uh, Hollywood came knocking. Um, and then there were, um, I sort of knew about it, but then, then that, that writer's strike happened, yeah, and there was right, force the majeure, time, right? yes. and so it was like, ah, oh, it's never oh, going to happen. Right. But then, um, and you know, so I didn't believe it until the first day of principal filming, mm -hmm. because 98% of book, of film options just don't happen. And so I did not believe it until it was actually 
officially <laughs> rolling. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's, I think that a lot of authors want to maintain control, and so they write into the contract everything but barbed wire between the author and the sets. Mm -hmm. I know nothing about. Oh, I think I was losing back, my yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. I know nothing about movie making, and I know that. So when they figured out that I wasn't going to step on their toes, they got they were they were flying me out to the sets. They let oh, my kids oh, have yeah. cameos in the movie. <laughs> oh wow! And so they got to walk the red carpet, and they're all they're, we're movie stars. Oh, and so yeah, so it was really a nice, it was really fun experience, like personally for my family. And so I wasn't involved with the you know with the direction or the artistic creative creativity mm -hmm. part of it, but it was just a really, really fun once in a lifetime mm -hmm. kind of thing. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, how soon do you feel like you start thinking about your next book once you finish the one you're working on? I start before I finish. Wow. I, by, by the end, because I know the story that I'm working on in broad strokes, so that part of it's sort of done. And, and the next character comes knocking, and I'm, I'm not finished yet. Back up. Lucky. Um, yeah, yeah, that's how, yeah. My, my idea is don't, I, have, I can't go and find an idea. It has to come and find me, mm -hmm. which is, and mm -hmm. I actually have a book in my um, folder now. That it's kind of my springboard book, mm -hmm. because I'll start working on it and think, oh, it's not a bad idea. I'll start. Mm -hmm. So I start working on it, and that's when my idea comes, yeah. and I abandon and it again. You, yeah, and you abandon but, it. Yeah, yeah, and so it, yeah. It, it, they come out of the blue. Um, this particular one, I actually have my idea. I got my idea, and I, I don't know about you, but mm -hmm. this is a real thing for writers. Mm -hmm. The hardest part of my day can be opening my file, just opening it. Really? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. if I don't open it, I don't have to do anything yeah. with it. But if right. I open it, then the <laughs> cursor is blinking yeah. at me. So, um, yeah. and so now I've got this idea going, and I. I I don't know if it's going to come to anything, and yeah. but I'm trying not to think about it, but I'm dreaming about it, and well, that back part. Yeah. So when I get off tour and I've finished mm -hmm. all the promo, I'm gonna. It's going to be a treat to open my file because yeah. I'll have something to put in it. Yeah. So I'm yeah, really excited about exciting. that. Yeah, yeah. So. that's yeah. incredible. A anybody else have any questions? I, I have a question for both of you. Hopefully, easy to answer. Um, you just mentioned, you know, as you're writing, another character will come forward. Is that what really comes first for you when you're writing? Is the character comes and you have their backstory and their history, and then you seek out a place afterwards to sort of put them in, or does it sort of happen? Do you see them in a period of time or anything like that? Or do you want to take the first? Take it first. Uh, sure. I um, I have an idea of what I think the characters should be and what their roles are going to be. And then I start writing the book, and then um, they come to life and take over and throw all my plans mm -hmm. out the window and tromp all over them mm -hmm. and set them on fire. And then I have to throw out the first part of the book mm -hmm. and go back and rewrite them and have them actually acting in character. And they become things I have no idea that they were going to be, and they become mm -hmm. real. And one of the reasons that I don't, I tend to have a little pause between my books is I get kind of a postpartum depression. Oh, me too. Yes. Because I really fall in love yes. with my characters and I yes. care and I miss them. And, yeah. and so I think it takes me that long. I start writing the yes. new book and I, when, I, when I fall in love with those characters, when they come to life and I fall in love with them, then let, I'm okay, yeah, I'm ready to let yeah. go and I can go back and do it properly. Yeah. So I need to do that to get over them. Yeah. And I think that I think that there, you, you know you would think there's this great celebration when you write the end, and I, it's it's relief, but it's followed by grief. Yeah. Because you are saying goodbye to this singularity of purpose that you've had. This, and you know that's what we're all looking for. What's my purpose today? My purpose, aside from my children and fending off my husband, <laughs> is, is to, you know, what what is it? Is it to get wolf? into the tram and, and to meet those women or whatever it is. So not yeah. having that and having to start fresh, it, it yeah. can be a real challenge. But um, yeah. So the tour is sort of yeah. like the farewell to them because yes. you get to revisit them and talk about yes. them for yeah. a while longer, which yeah. I like. Sprinkle their ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Lori. Hi. Um, I thought it was really poignant when you spoke about the mountain in your new novel being a character. And I just wanted to know, without giving away too much of the story, um, you know, uh, forces of nature are also often seen like as just destructive. But I know in that area of the US, they sort of have a more, uh, you know, dichotomy for the people that are indigenous to the area as something that is, 
empowering, and yet that power can be quite destructive. So I'm just wondering, for your character, was the mountain more of an antagonist, strictly, or was it part of the um, thing that helped him clearly survive, again, without giving away too much of the novel? Well, both. And, and that's a really, it's a really wonderful question, and I appreciate that. And, and speaking to the indigenous people, although it's not really apparent when you read the story, I spent, and you, you know, you hunt and gather, and you have all of this information, and, and you spend a month researching, as I did the Cahuilla Indians, who are native to the Palm Springs area, and I thought that they were going to be a huge part of this book, but what they really did was inform the mountain. Um, and, and so, yes, the mountain is both. It, it, it's, it's both an antagonist and, and savior. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, then we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, Sarah Gruen and Lori Lanson. Thank you both thank so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.